Hello, uh, welcome to the Farfish Software Future of Rec Crowdcast. Um, I'm your host, Cameron McLennan, and today I am luckily to be joined by Dulta Doherty. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thanks for having me, Cameron. No problem at all. Um, would you mind just by starting off by telling the audience a little bit about your background and, and what it is that you do, please? Yeah, I suppose firstly, um, I, uh, I first came across your podcast uh, when I started doing research and to do my own and I really enjoyed it and yeah it's kind of funny now that I'm appearing on podcasts and stuff I thought then it was so far out of reach but once you start kind of doing a bit of content on that you're you find yourself in in that world thanks but uh but yeah look I, I run an international rec to rec business we've been going for about four years and um, before that I worked for Robert Walters for a few years in Australia and I work for a national Canadian recruitment company in Canada and we moved at the in Canada the economy collapsed and yeah. myself and my wife moved to Guatemala and we set up our rec to rec business from there we traveled the world and come back I've had two kids in two years and yeah. here we are in the south of England brilliant so um one of the things, Delta, so I obviously um, have known you for, for some time and you run a very successful podcast yourself. Um, I listened to one of your episodes where you um, spoke about um, reading a book by Tim Ferriss called The 4-Hour Workweek. That's a book that I had listened to and then subsequently bought and, and, uh, and read myself, found it really, really interesting. And mm -hmm. he talks about people, um, talks about the new rich. Yeah. Now, um, what does, uh, in your eyes, what does it mean to be a new rich recruiter? It's a good question. Um, I suppose, like, to, to answer that properly, I'd, I'd probably take myself back to being under a lot of pressure in an aggressive sales room with Robert Walters. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky to have the job and it worked out and it's great and I'm, I'm appreciative of it. But uh, it was tough. And to be like the biggest biller in the room and to continually to do that was a lot of stress over, over the few years that I was with him. And I just remember thinking, why am I sitting here in a suit and tie and it's like 30, 40 degrees outside? Like, it, why do I have to sit in this room for 10 hours? Well, why are we do? Why am I doing all my time doing administration? Mm -hmm. and, and that led us to setting up by ourselves. Yeah. Um, and during that process, I was thinking, like, I'm rubbish at so many things. Like, I'm rubbish at administration. I hate it. So I was overloading Charlotte with all the work. And she was hating me more and more every day, mm -hmm. you know, because like I, I'll, I'll do a bit of chat when a client, you know, when a when when a candidate, whatever, and then she's left with all the all the work because I'm just rubbish with administration. So that led me to doing a bit of research into outsourcing, which led me to Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week, which yep. basically means you focus on the stuff you're good at, and then everything else you find somebody else to do that for you. So if you work out what's your hourly rate, um, it, I could pay somebody a lot less to do work that would take me longer. So it yep. makes more sense for me to focus on things that bring in revenue, create the brand, and, 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 and keep the machine running, really. Yeah, now that sounds really, really simple in practice, but is it is it simple? It's a good question again. Um, it's not, and my wife is really talented. Um, and one of, in the way that Tim Ferriss describes it, he got he. So, firstly, you document what you do in the week, mm -hmm. and then out of that, you can slowly start taking little pieces away. So, yeah. say if it's to start, it's uh, it's sending connection requests on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. You, know, you could have somebody else doing that right now. You could you could have that automated, whatever it is. But if it's that and then it's the first message that you're sending, or even if it's the second message, whatever pieces of the puzzle you can give to someone else, you do that bit by bit. But you have to, you can't just go, here's a hundred things, find an admin and make them do it. You have to build them up slowly, slowly, slowly over time. And we've uh 
or or two are very skilled and they're full on recruiters now they're they're account managers but we built them up over the four years so i guess um like so what you're saying to me here makes a makes a lot of sense because i don't know a single recruiter that is a fan of admin and in actual fact most recruiters find themselves doing this job because they're fantastic at talking to people they're mm. good at they're good at selling they're good at building relationships yeah. um There'll be people watching this just now that, that find that your your sort of approach quite interesting. Um, mm. Is but also at the same time there'll be people who are really skeptical about it as well. Mm. Is it is it realistically achievable for recruitment agencies to 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 release the reins to to virtual assistants or or uh, or the like? Depends on the size of the agency, and it depends. Like I suppose, like one thing that they do when I was in an agency, they got somebody to format resumes, right? Okay. So, and there are a lot of agencies now do the data, do the data scraping and build all of that. So, so they are doing it already. It's then working out who should send interview confirmations, who should work out the diary schedule. And is that extra touch point going to help you make money mm -hmm. or is it because because that's the argument right the yeah, more yeah. I, the more i get at that client the more i can squeeze out of them yeah. but is that true i don't know like do we have any data to, to to back that up because when we have 50 interviews happening around the world and i know that somebody's better at scheduling interviews and working diaries and and that than me then i'm i'm way better at focusing in on the qualitative stuff that adds value okay so how are you feel how is your days how are your days filled at the moment then yeah so basically just pretend i'm joe rogan all day long. <laughs> 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 yeah my wife would tell you we don't do enough but or i don't do enough but the it's half term right so we've two kids out under two my wife has just come back to the business and we've launched a local rpo business mm -hmm. so whoever's the least busiest has to pick up the kids at uh, three thirty, so typically that's me uh, for this week. And yeah. th there's a lot of challenges in running a business with your wife, and that's uh, when you have two kids under two. It's it's tough. But I suppose I would start I would start my day um, start my day going through messages on LinkedIn, and um, and from uh, and from my emails, see what's come in from inbound and all the rest. And um, then I would. Uh, I'll have a look at my schedule. Usually I'll have a podcast to record. I'll have I'll have four or five candidate calls scheduled in the diary and I'll have uh, maybe a client meeting as well. Podcasts can probably kind of are a bit like client meetings sometimes. Like 50% are our clients that we work with. We try and keep it interesting and have lots of other people like, you know, DSP or Dave Hume or people yep. in the sourcing community and, and that. Um, and then now that we're launching the, the this other business, we've got an office now, we're, we've just hired somebody. Um, so now it's trying to trying to help Charlotte win some business on that side, hire some staff internally. Uh, and then in the evening, I'll make sure a bit of exercise in, in during the day. Um, in the evenings, I'll take calls from six till eight or six till nine most nights. Yep. Um, and then I'm on WhatsApp, you know, whatever, going back and forth. The problem is we do we do business all over the world. So Australia people need stuff first thing in the morning and last thing at night. Yep. Clients can be a bit feisty over there as well. Yeah. yeah. It's a hungry marketplace. Um, mid afternoon is a lot of uh, the USA, and now we're focused on London as well. So most of the rest of the day is. Uh, is, tr is trying to get in, in on that. So the things that you've implemented from the four hour week into the business, has that made it easier for you with the internationalization, having the clients and candidates in different time zones? Well, I couldn't, I, like we, we just burnt out when we tried to do it ourselves because if you get a good candidate, they're going to get six interviews and one of four of them are going to decide that they don't want to do the interviews. Yeah. Because for whatever reason, they were just testing the water and they got scared as soon as you get them interviews. Less and less, we get better qualifying them as time goes on, but yeah. it happens. And then you have to reschedule them all 
And yeah. then before you know it, you're up all night trying to trying to do it all. But the way I would look at it is Andrea does 25 to 30 hours a week for me. Mm-hmm. That's hours that I would have to do administration in and sourcing in. Yeah. And Marina does uh, just 30 to 40 hours a week for me. So again, and a lot large part of that would be sourcing. I, again, I couldn't I couldn't do it. Yeah. So if anybody is watching this and they're thinking, love this, this all sounds this all sounds like gravy, it's a great idea. Yeah. Um would you all did you like just start with a single task for um for someone you're outsourcing to and then build it up that yeah. way? Yeah. Yeah. So once you get one in so yes, start with one. Get it. Uh, get a single task done. Build her up every week. Give another task, and then when they have a perfect, give them another task. So you might start them on five hours a week. You yep. might start them on then go to ten hours, then go to fifteen, and then before you know it, you know they become part of the furniture. Then that assistant is 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 to train the next one. So whatever task we do, Charlotte will write detailed work instructions and workflow documents. Okay. And they'll be able to specifically go through it on that. A lot, a lot of the problem that happens when people try and get virtual assistants is they do it on the cheap. Mm-hmm. So, like, our, our our girls are quite well. Are they're, they're educated? They've got a bit of administration experience. Mm-hmm. Andre is based in the UK. Arena is based in Serbia. Mm-hmm. But then, for the more redundant, repetitive tasks. We'll go to the Philippines. We've got uh, Giselle there, um, so her English wouldn't be as good. So yeah. she would do a lot of uh, just a lot of the very basic stuff that's repetitive. Yep. Um, to take to almost take away the work from the girls. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah. I think, God, I'd, I'd love a day where I didn't have to do any admin at all. You know, and focus on the revenue generating stuff, just on the pounds and pence. And I think there's plenty of people in here that would agree that that's that's where your time's best spent. Yeah. Um, if you're if you're a recruiter, um, what's been the biggest challenge that you've had as a business in adopting that sort of model? Um, I suppose because we did it quite early on. Mm-hmm. Look, I, again, I'm very lucky to have Charlotte in the business and she was able to do all of this. Yep. So the biggest challenge was Charlotte went and had two kids in two years. Mm-hmm. So I had we had to make we had to replace her within two years, within, I don't know, four, four weeks. And at that time, we were we were driving around Europe and um, just having a good time and doing all the stuff that I'd still love to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But but yeah, that 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 was a challenge. I could imagine the challenge for anybody who's listening would, to, to to be able to do this would be to give up control, to believe that oh nobody writes an email like I write an email. Nobody, nobody sends an interview request like I do. Nobody mm-hmm. sends a message like that's simply not true. Like you can you can train people to do it, and I suppose the other bit then is to trust people who are not on site. Yeah. So, and, and again, that's built up over time. Like I think we're going to touch on it later, but Gary V would say, give all the give all the trust and then let them mess it up from there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think there's just uh, the recruitment industry as a whole has a problem with things like allowing people to work from or not not most of the industry not all but a lot of it has that whole fear of relinquishing control you know you must be in if you're a billing recruiter or you're doing anything for the Mm -hmm. business you must be in the office there must be a bum in that seat over there to be doing it and i just think it's in this day and age particularly when it comes to attracting talent and flexibility and that's just so backwards i think there's um i think a lot about that as well cameron and it might be down to the the 360 model very Mm -hmm. difficult it's there's so much happening and now that there's all the branding stuff that you're expected to do as well mm-hmm. i think i think it, i think it's a tremendous amount of work to be able to get good at to be able to yep. trust somebody to, to to work at home um data and information is ubiquitous now but it, it used to be we used to have to sit on a computer and the server would be there and and so so now that you can log in from anywhere Yep. Companies will be more data. I think you'll probably know in software sales that 
a lot of it, like there is a lot more flexibility because there's that if it is a sales job and they know specifically what they're doing it's much easier to manage them than a 360 that's doing a bit of this a bit of that it, it, it's a tough one for agency owners i i, I don't uh, i think if there's something we haven't done right it's we haven't like we've built a 10 12 with the brand with yep. the automation system but we we haven't got a good call center going yet yep um, I, I will. I would like to have a mixture of both going eventually. Um, so I, I don't want to be the the four hour work week guy. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But I think with the three hundred and sixty model as well, it's it's a baffling one because you need to be speaking to candidates a lot of the time out with the working day. So I don't know. It's tough. I think that that models a little bit on the, the flaws. Don't get me wrong. There's lots of people that make a lot of money from, from having 360 recruiters, but right. I think there's other ways to approach it um, nowadays. There is. And I, I think we touched upon it before we went on air. We've just launched a local RPO and, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of refreshing to, not be in the Rector X space exclusively anymore. Yeah. And to go back to doing what myself and Charlotte did beforehand as well. And to to be able to pitch to founders on, on their whole pipeline and to be able to work with the business on their employer branding and to be able to discuss that. It's it, it's quite refreshing. I've uh, I've 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 pitched it to people within the recruitment industry, but it's very much just send us a candidate. I mm-hmm. am I, I'm good. So I'm like, okay. Bye. <laughs> yeah, it's a definition of a true partnership, isn't it? When you're having those conversations yeah. and you work together on a long term with it. Um, I've got an interesting question from uh, Helen um, on the right there. So how did you actually find the people that you outsource to? It's a great question. Yeah, so uh, we would go on Upwork. Okay. So that's the, that's the short answer of it. Um, and then we probably look at Eastern European people mainly. Um, usually you'll find that well-educated, hardworking, and culturally quite aligned. Yep. Um, and but again, if it's a, a really cheap task, a really like re, like repetitive one, then I go to the Philippines. I've had a lot of trouble with uh, India, with Pakistan, with uh, America's too expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, but what we do is once we get it right with with them, we'll bring them straight off, uh, straight off Upwork, and put them onto Payoneer. Okay, because that gives them a twenty percent increase in the in the hourly rate. Ah, right. Okay, and then would you are you setting them like a a, ta- a task or a test or anything like that? Yeah. So yeah. the first interview is a test. Okay. Okay. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, a good one as well from Don. Besides Tim Ferriss, who else has influenced you? Yeah, this one Great probably should not going too well, but I, I'm I am so I, I'm really I'm really into Gary V. Um. And a large part of of what we've done with the podcast and and how we've gone about that is uh, is been from what I've learned from from listening to him. It's very simple stuff, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that's why I'm a, I'm a pretty simple guy, so that's why it's resonated. That's one of the things that's very noticeable about how you run your agency is that you obviously recognise the value and importance of good marketing. Um, mm-hmm. Can you tell us a bit about why you think marketing is so important in the recruitment industry and take us through the th- how you like to market you and your business? <laughs> well, I suppose first thing, question. <laughs> yeah, that is. Uh, I did a postgrad in marketing a thousand years ago, so uh, it, it's, it's always been kind of something I was interested in, and I probably just wasn't bright enough to get into that industry. I didn't have the administration skills to to get into one side and I didn't have the art skills to get into the other. So, uh, so eventually I got into this game. Um, and then I suppose the, 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 the basics of, of, of recruitment, it, it gets a bit repetitive for me. So I, I like the creative side. Mm-hmm. Um, why is it important to market? I suppose marketing is there to set to surface sales, right? Mm-hmm. But it's, it's also there to guide the whole business towards their direction. So, yeah. I think, I think it's just something that that that's that's really interested me. One of the things I was really surprised at was I saw on your Instagram the other day that you've had a hundred guests on your podcast in the past year. Yeah. And that's a real, that is a seriously dedicated effort in putting out good quality content. What's mm-hmm. that done for your brand yeah. and, and your business? 
Um, well, your 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 brand's what people say when you're not uh, when you're when you're not you're not in front of them or listening. So hopefully it's hopefully it's done all right. Um, but as you know, the the recruitment to recruitment industry and we, we service the same people. Um, it goes quiet at, at, at certain times of year of the year, and I was determined not to get depressed last summer, yeah. um, so I just went for it and got a couple of put a couple of mates on that worked out. I knew they were charming. I knew they could kind of do their thing. I then went through my LinkedIn feed and seen who was kind of popular. Yep, and um, got a few others on on that, and then I started going after bigger hitters like Greg Savage. Yep. Um, and and and, if, and people like that, and then I thought, right, okay, I kind of have this down a little bit now, and I started thinking, right, bring in clients. Mm -hmm. So started filtering in them every three, four episodes. Yep. So uh, and then what I I suppose what we do then is uh, there's a thing called the Gary V content model, mm -hmm. and what you try and do is create pillar content. So for us, that was doing a round table or when we flew to New York, yep. we, we met with all the clients and we did all, we got a videographer, Charlotte found her on LinkedIn, just met her up, met her on the day, did all the content. And um, then me and me and Charlotte would sit down with a glass of wine, go through all the content, turn that into micro content yep. and then give that, give that to the team to disperse across all the different channels and use it in part of our messaging sequencing yep. and also whenever we're engaging with candidates towards our clients we will send them here's the podcast we did with toby bab isn't he great what do you think Are you sure you want to interview with anybody else right okay yeah love them bang uh, okay okay so you really are squeezing as much bang for your buck as you possibly can out of every bit every, of content every like out of that piece of content, every yeah. every bit is squeezed out, and and it's it, it it works. Like I, we've had a we've had a direct ROI on clients that we've never placed with before, but that we kind of sent people to before. They understood stood us more. We had a better understanding of them, and because I was interviewing them, and really letting them be the hero of their own story. Yeah. The candidate that's listening was able to really identify and go, maybe I could be you someday, or maybe maybe I'd like to work for you. Maybe I could learn off you. You seem all right. I like you. Maybe I'd have a beer with you. And all these thoughts will be going through the candidate's head. And then, you know, that's that leads it uh, leads it to being a closer point of sale, really, isn't it? Yeah, totally. And I, I love that. And that's what um what were the barriers to entry for you to start up a podcast? No. No. My, just my wife said you, you're an idiot you, you, you like i don't want to hear you spout on on the internet about mad stuff that you talk about in the house like so like you know you, like you have a different idea every half hour like what are you going to do you just like it's my mom was like i don't think this is a good idea you know yeah uh, and and then uh and then i just just did it with a couple of mates and and they were like oh that was quite good and it the thing is we're trained interviewers yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, if we don't know how to interview people after doing this for like eight, nine years, like it's it's the perfect it's the perfect foil, really. I think, um, and also there's something intimate about about just just voice and not and not the visuals. Yeah, you find like people will relax a bit more, and you can kind of take them into deeper waters with your questioning. Has anybody ever said no to you that you've approached to be a guest on your on your podcast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, look, tremendous amount of founders. Yeah, not, okay. Not our thing. Um, I've even been said, look, why don't you make a placement first and then I'll come on? I'm like, what? What? You want to pay me ten grand? And <laughs> then you want to come on for employer branding? Would Would you not come on and get my audience for free? Yeah. Um, but like. <laughs> It's funny. I, in in Ireland, I have a new founder reaching out to me every every week. So it's really it's they're they're all going for it now because it's a lot of it's a boom market. And it's all guys my age that are setting up agencies. Yep. Um. In 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 America, 
all the UK agencies, yeah, big time. In Australia, sometimes mm -hmm. they're they they're they're still a bit a bit behind. Um, and in the UK, yeah, L London's definitely catching up. Yeah. yeah, and in Asia, they're great. Like all the guys in Asia want to tell their story. You know, e expats in general. Yeah, if um if you're watching this and you're thinking about run you run an agency, you're thinking about starting a podcast. Would you give any advice you would give people? Yeah, just uh, just just start with that. Start with interviewing somebody that you know. Um, yeah. Use Anchor. Um, and just just give it a go. Try and do it for half an hour. Um, until you know what you're doing, write some questions out. Mm -hmm. um, try and just keep the conversation flowing. Think of somebody interesting that you know. Like my mate Gareth played professional football, mm -hmm. and I. I we ended up working together in Robert Walters, and yeah. I knew that that journey from having like having everybody going, "Oh wow, you're a professional footballer," to get on the phone, yeah, like, and now he owns his own agency, and like he was in New York whenever I went to Canada, and I just knew that that was an interesting story to get started with. Yeah. So, like, do yourself a favor, like, get get somebody easy on that you know at the start, and then just like try not to sell too much. Mm -hmm. You know, try and make it about like I, I hate I hate people who just monologue. So yeah. like try and make it about the guest and their journey and not how amazing you are and how smart you are. Yeah. That's that's probably really important. That's sound advice. And I think that every everyone that works in an agency has uh, valuable things to say about that about that market, agency owners, etc. So um yeah, it's worthwhile. Do do you measure your um your market and roi and if so like what sort of metrics do you use yeah not well um, okay so that's that's the first um so i've hired a freelancer twice a week now so you've noticed my instagram she does that um, okay. um i'm starting to learn how to use it a little bit but she's kind of 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 that generation i I spend most of my time marketing on LinkedIn or creating that. So I'll watch the, I'll watch the viral threads on that. Like I had one that went to two hundred thousand this week. Yeah. Um, and and there's kind, I kind of know how to do that now. Yeah. Um, so so I'll keep an eye, I'll keep an eye on that. In terms of the website, I'll get that reports on that from, uh, from from my mate Carol who runs the website. But we don't in rec to rec, you don't really get much candidate flow. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of the podcast, Anchor has all the stats on that. So I know that there's been seventy thousand downloads, um, and out of that, I know that you know most of the listeners are USA and they're independent recruiters or they're agency recruiters based in England and Ireland and Australia. Um, and then in terms of ROI, I know what who we've placed with that's come out of the podcast. Yep, but. Like I, I don't know, for example, see see the way that you're able to tell there's 108 people here, you know who they are, you know their emails, you can retarget them, you can do all that stuff to them. I don't know who's listened to the podcast because I don't have those, I don't have that stats. Yeah. So that's a that's something we need to work on, obviously. Um I hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. I'm not a marketing expert, just kind of figuring out as we go along. So words, words asking there. So as a rector, do you think you have a distinct advantage when doing a podcast, and that you have a deeper understanding of your industry than most recruiter servicing industries they've never worked in? Hmm. Um, it depends how interested you are in the industry that you're going into. I had a, I, I was stuck in a rut. I, my wife was having a baby, was was having our children. I kind of just felt like business wasn't going where I thought it would be my peers were overtaking me yeah and I had a whole network of people to reach out to to study off and learn off for free yeah so it, in in that journey it, it 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 made for interesting learning for me and then I know that there's so many other founders who are in a similar similar stage and given that given that maybe maybe it is but like if you're really into it, I think I think yeah, it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I think if you're really immersed in the market that you you know that you're involved in, you yeah. do great at it. Yeah. So, um, um, 
And Teresa's uh, Teresa's asking you've seventy thousand downloads of your podcast. One year. One year, brilliant. That is an unbelievable reach for uh, for starting a, a year ago. It's fantastic. Yeah. And the, the more I like, whenever I was doing them frequently, like five a week, I was getting way more than right now when I do one or two. Really? Yeah. Is that, is that to do with the way the podcast platforms operate? Were they giving you more visibility, or did you um, know? No, I think. I think, look, the general secret is the more people that you interview, the more times you get them to share your the podcast you did with them, yep. the more you're reaching out to newer people and you're building things. Also, I think the podcast, you get better the more you do it. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, that you, you just kind of go on a bit of a roll. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Um, what do you think the future holds for uh, recruitment agencies? Ooh, that's a tough one, isn't it? Um, well, we're focused on the RPO side. As a, if I've learned anything over the last year, it's 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 that I want to be as close to whoever makes the decision on the money as possible, and I want to I want to I want to work with with them on their talent acquisition and on their employer branding, and really have a seat at the table. So. I, I think that's the future because anything else out of that, like once you have that, you could do a specialist agency off the back of it. But don't get me wrong, specialist, specialist 360 agencies still work and I don't see them going anywhere. But I think some of the figures of maybe what the S3s of this world are, are making now compared to what they did before per head are way down. Yeah. Uh, barriers to entry are so low that there's more and more independence setting up and you know competition's intense so how can you give yourself an edge how can you add value how can how can you do it so you enjoy it and you don't burn out yeah and all all, all those things I, I i think about those things all the time you know you know i've been doing this show now for three years i think and that's my yeah. favorite answer to that question hmm. Yeah, awesome. So on that note, guys, just want to say a massive thank you to Delta for taking time out of his day to join us today on the show. Also, thanks to all the guests that came in to uh, join us and uh, particularly those that commented down the right hand side. It's really, really appreciated. Um, Delta, if anyone wants to reach out to you after this for a, for a chat, what's the best way to, 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 to get a hold yeah, of you? Yeah, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn um, or message me if you're, uh, if you're already connected or connect with me on Facebook. I'm always in the Facebook groups. If you want to come on the podcast, just hit me up. Um, I'm not fussy. Um, just just come on, have a chat, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss what we both love. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time. Um, I've dropped a link to an ebook below as well if you want to turn your agency into an inbound recruiting machine in seven steps. So you pop over there and have a look at that if you want as well. Delta, thanks so much for your time, mate. I thoroughly Perfect. appreciate it. It was really good having you on. Thanks. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye.